Hey, everybody. My name is Dan Sandler. I'm a software engineer on the Android System UI team, uh, and I'm here to tell you about the new stuff in the System UI in Android 11. First, how are you doing? We hope you're well. It's good to see you, although I can't actually see you, but it's it's nice to imagine. Um, oh, we're, we're OK. Thanks. Thanks for asking. Uh, the team has been keeping busy. Um, I avoided giving myself bangs, so you know, you're welcome. Um, we've uh, got lots of bugs in the Android 11 beta for you. Sorry, we've fixed lots of bugs in the Android 11 beta for you, uh, but we saved some time for features, and I do want to talk about a few of them just real briefly for you today. We're going to talk about conversations, bubbles, device controls, and the media player. All right, let's talk about conversations. We know from our user research and our own personal experience that notifications to and from real people are the most important to us. They bring us the most joy. They're also often the most urgent, requiring a prompt response. Our user research team actually had a really great talk about this a couple of years ago at Google I.O., so I encourage you to go back and check that out. A lot of those conclusions are definitely still valid today. What we've done in Android 11 is added a dedicated persistent space for these notifications so that you can quickly see and respond to them. So let's take a look at that. First, I want to show you Android 10. We've got it here on the left. It's not bad, but could it be better? We have some conversations that are interspersed with less urgent notifications. Uh, we have multiple chats from one app compressed into a very, very small space in the grouping system. It's hard to spot any particular sender's name or chat room name, and those avatars are really small and kind of off to the side. Here we have Android 11. The first thing you're going to notice is that we've got a nice separate section just for conversations with a big section header to actually explain what that's for. The next thing you might see is a unread message indicator. We had that in notifications before, but now it's nice and big so that you can see if there's a chat room that maybe got a little bit away from you. It's much easier now as you look up and down the shade to see the names of people and chat rooms that these conversations pertain to. The primary action, the expand affordance, is much easier to see and get to. And of course, once you expand a notification, you can do inline replies or predicted replies or launch through into the app. And then finally, we made those avatars bigger and moved them all to the same spot with the same margins. It looks great. The user can also long press any conversation and mark it as important. That'll make it appear first in the list and break through do not disturb. Uh, that's a feature that notifications had already. We've made sure it looks really good and works really well with the conversation space as well. So as a developer, what you're asking at this point is, OK, what do I need to do to get my chat app into the conversation space? All right, get a pen. There's a lot here. Are you ready? Step one, use messaging style. Step two, add a shortcut ID. Yeah, that's it. That's it, just two, I, I, almost. All right, finally a code slide. Let's take a look at how we do this. First, you want to create the person object. This is something you were already doing if you were using messaging style since it's required for that API. And second, you're going to want to create a shortcut and register it with a shortcut manager. Now, this might be something that you're already doing if you have launcher shortcuts or sharing shortcuts, but now you're going to do that for your notifications as well. There are a couple parts that are new that I want to draw your attention to. First, the fact that you're marking the shortcut is long lived, meaning the system can hold on to it and use it in other spaces. And secondly, attach that person object that you just created. Then finally, with your notification builder, you get to put it all together. Uh, make sure you include that shortcut ID, and everything's going to work just great. All right, let's talk about bubbles. You may remember bubbles from Android 10 when we showed it off as a developer preview feature. Well, it has graduated from a developer preview to a full user feature as part of our conversation system. The user can grab a conversation that they're actively engaging with, pull it out into a bubble that floats on top of the phone display uh, as a part of a multitasking feature. To do this, you're going to use the bubble metadata, which we introduced, again, last year in Android 10. Um, but the new thing here is that you're going to add that same shortcut ID that you put together for the conversation space. The bubble is automatically going to pull the icon out of that shortcut ID, uh, make sure it's an adaptive icon as well so that it fills the whole shape of the bubble. And then make sure, as before, when you put a pending intent into the bubble metadata, that that pending intent points to an activity that is resizable, because this is a multi-window feature, and that window is going to show up at a different size than the display, so it needs to be prepared to be resizable. In the coming weeks, we're going to have a talk entirely dedicated to all things conversations, bubbles, and notifications in Android 11, so look for that coming soon. 
Okay, let's talk about device controls. This is really fun. In Android 11, we've created a new dedicated persistent space for your home and Internet of Things controls so that you can quickly find and use them at any time. We've redesigned the power menu for this. It places your device controls just a button press away or a long button press away. Uh, as a user, you can choose the set of controls that you use most. Um, those will show up here in the power menu, and you can actually even switch between different providers from different apps that provide IoT and home controls. To do this, we've introduced a brand new API, the Android Service Controls API Suite for device controls providers. It's one of our first Java 9 Reactive Streams APIs, so grab your favorite Flow uh, implementation and let's get started. Your implementation of the Controls Provider Service has a few key APIs that it will need to implement. The first one is to create publisher for all available controls. So publisher in reactive streams means it's a thing that's going to be able to generate new instances of the object as they change. Uh, in this case, the publisher is going to list all of the controls objects that you know about as a provider that the user might want to choose from. There's a similar API that you also need to implement that is just create publisher for. This is what the system UI is going to use when it knows which are the controls the user really wants to engage with and just wants to ask you for updates about those three or four or five, or 20. Then finally, your controls provider service wants to know when the user has clicked on a control, and that's what perform control action is for. Uh, you're going to know what control was clicked on, uh, what kind of action it was, if it was a click or a drag, something like that. Uh, and then you're going to get a consumer object to which you can pass a status of response OK, letting it know that you heard the response and have actually made the change in the real world that the user has asked for. OK, here's an example of one of those control objects that your publishers are going to push. Uh, it's a simple object uh, representing a light bulb. There are a few pieces. There's a pending intent, first of all, which is a way for the user to long press on the control and get back into your app to be able to control other things uh, inside your app's context. There's also a template that tells System UI how to actually draw that control. And then finally, you'll wrap it all up together in a control builder that holds some state uh, that you then put into the publisher and send to System UI. This is a more complicated example. It's a description of a thermostat, and there's actually quite a lot going on there. I'm not going to read through all of the code here, but this and a lot of other device types are supported by the system. Go ahead and check out the API documentation with the 11 beta. OK, finally, let's talk about the media player. This is mostly an end user feature, um, but there are a few APIs in here, too, to be aware of. Uh, first of all, in Android Lollipop, we introduced the media style notifications so that apps didn't have to keep using remote views for their uh, media playback. And most of you are using media style by now. Most of you. Um, Android 11 creates a dedicated persistent space for all of these media players so that the user can quickly control and even resume content. Are you seeing a pattern here? Yes, we have a lot of dedicated persistent spaces in Android 11 for the stuff that we know users use a lot and need to be able to get access to. So media controls uh, now live in the quick settings panel for easy access no matter what app is in front uh, or which notifications you've received. And yes, they even show up on the lock screen. And we've even added an output picker right there in the media player. You're welcome. So uh, I did say there's a little bit of API. If you, as a media player app, implement media browser service, your card can actually be resumed. That means that System UI will hang on to it and let the user go back and pick up that podcast or that uh, two hour long synthwave set uh, hours after they have paused it or possibly even after a reboot, um, even after that media session is destroyed. OK, that's all I've got. Uh, go get the Android 11 beta, try out those APIs, report those bugs. We really need those reports. And thank you for watching. This was fun for me, hopefully for you too. Still miss Chet and Romain.